Tom, welcome to uh, Moneyball Medicine. Well, thanks for having me, Harry. It's always a, a pleasure talking with you. So, Tom, I, and I really want to get into like the personal background and 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 the work that you've been doing, but but I want to start with a really sort of big idea. I want to I want you to explain to the group uh, what you're doing with your group on the value of AI and statistical machine learning and drug discovery and clinical trial management. And, and if you're right, how does it pay off? Yeah, well, it's a great question, Harry. And I, I can talk for, I, I could bore your listeners for days on, <laughs> on the topic uh, here. But basically, I, I think what we're doing, the bottom line is that we are using machine learning, artificial intelligence, computational statistics, uh, to further our collective understanding of basically human biology. And we now have scientific evidence or experimentally uh, proven scientific evidence that these algorithms or these approaches are actually capable of teaching us the rules that govern the underlying molecular constituents, if you will, that drive cellular behavior and dictate phenotype. And I think that that is the biggest thing in this space anyway, that AI and machine learning is going to do for us is that we can't fully address human disease until we have a fuller understanding, a more robust understanding of the rules that govern human biology. And that's what we're doing uh, in the lab. So if you think about it, right, you're, you're basically able to understand the characters of the movie and how the movie is moving forward through its frames? Somewhat, yes. And, and it's very analogous to an analogy that I, I like to use. Uh, Google came out with something called knowledge graphs, probably clear back in 2012. Yeah. And they, they have far reaching implications in just about every sector. Um, and, and especially in, in the biomedical uh, sciences, but currently, and I, I like to use the analogies of, of GPS and Google Maps. We know we currently know how to get from point A to point B. And so we can then monitor traffic flow, say from Cambridge, Massachusetts, up to Medford, Massachusetts, where I live. And we can make predictions about how long that that's going to take. Well, currently at the molecular level in human biology, we don't have that underlying roadmap. And that's right. what we're actually working on is that we're able, we are working and, and again, we have evidence that these algorithms can actually build causal dependency structures. And I'll explain what that means, I'm sure as we talk uh, or we go on here this afternoon, is that they are capable of building causal dependency structures that are actually reflective of the signal transduction cascades or how all these proteins interact with one another within the cell and actually drive cellular behavior and dictate phenotype. So that is what we're going after is this molecular physiologic map that once built, will be able to track molecular information flow through this map. And at even given point where that information deviates, we'll be able to put a molecular fingerprint on all known human disease. So now let's back up here, right? You've got this, you know, I wanna sort of understand how you ended up as, as chief data officer, how you, you got there. I mean, I think with your background of molecular biology and computational statistics, it sounds like a dream job. So how did you get to where you are? Yeah, that that has that has been a long arduous road, <laughs> if you will, and I and I don't want to. I sound like I'm whining here, uh, Harry, but I I for my undergraduate degree is in exercise science. My first master's degree is in exercise physiology and biochemistry, and what as I was going, I started to learn how to ask more involved questions, and along that road, I understood that I needed a greater understanding of molecular biology. I needed a greater understanding of the quantitative principles and of statistics to be able to answer or address these questions. And so, you know, it's been a very long road. I hold a doctorate in molecular biology as well as in computational statistics, 
went on to postdocs in molecular and cellular cardiology, and then finally a second postdoc uh, in biostatistics and computational Jesus. biology. So <laughs> it's been a long road. I didn't get out and start making any money. And your wife, my wife will tell you exactly this, is that <laughs> we really didn't start making any money till I was 50. So You know, it's, you're, 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 you're the perfect poster child for lifelong learning. There you go. Um, and I was I, family and friends accused me of being a professional student for years. Uh, I, I tell you, I, I always think to myself that I do want to go back to school. I mean, there's so much to dig into these days. And when you're working, sometimes you just don't have time to right. dig in as deep as you'd like. So um, now your organization, you know, it, it, it doesn't develop drugs right now. It, it seems to be focused more on the services, if I'm correct. And, you know, um, you know, you do genome sequencing, manage and, and analytics and in all these different areas. So before we focus on so sort of the AI and machine learning and predictive analytics, can you can you give your the listener sort of a big picture uh, of of what, you know, your organization does or who we are? Yeah, I think yeah. we're still trying to figure that out as well, Harriet. So I've been with the company <laughs> for five years. Uh, we used to refer to ourselves as a contract genomics organization. We are now uh, touting that we are a data insights company. So we have offices in Reykjavik, Iceland, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, we were in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we've just relocated across the river here uh, in Boston. And Basically, we're enabling drug development. I, I think we're, the current state or status of where we are, we have some of the largest uh, patient cohorts in the world. Uh, and so we sequence these patients. Uh, and then the lab that I oversee, we're responsible for generating usable um, information uh, from the, this, these large, high dimensional data sets. Does that help? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, get people to understand what you guys do. And then I think it'll be easier for everybody to understand this concept of predictive analytics and, and, and how it generates value going forward. Sure, sure. So, but, but Genuity didn't start as Genuity. It was formerly Wuxi Nextcode. And so- it was. And, and I think it goes back even further than that to, you said Iceland, so I'm, I'm throwing yep. in decode genetics, which, wow, that's a blast from the past. Um, yep. <laughs> well, you know, when I was at Applied Biosystems, decode was a, a big subject to talk about. Um, how does that legacy sort of shape the services or the research that you have today or that you're, you're moving into, into today? Yeah, so to give everyone an understanding of where we've come from is that Kari Stephenson and Jeff Gulcher, the co-founders of Decode Genetics uh, there in Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, Jeff and a group of others that were basically the core executive group uh, of Decode Genetics ended up branching off with Kari's blessing uh, and starting something called Nextcode Health. About 2015, Wuxi Aptech, the largest CRO in the world, based in Shanghai, yeah. actually acquired uh, Wuxi, I'm sorry, Nextcode Health. Hence, we have Wuxi Nextcode Genomics. Uh, we were there up until, uh, I think, probably the spring of this year. Uh, we just, just formally changed the name and restructured the company as Genuity Science. But there were some issues that we had run into being uh, owned by a, a Chinese uh, entity. Yes. So uh, <laughs> we got out from underneath that. Uh, we're still working closely uh, with everyone. So everyone's playing nice uh, with each other. Um, but that's basically the legacy. So from yeah. decode genetics, uh, statistical uh, genetics is basically where we come from. So some of the legacy software that was developed at Decode, we still yeah. use science. What is different now is this R&D arm that we have at Genuity Science. And my boss, our chief scientific officer, Jeff Gulcher, the co-founder of Decode Genetics and the co-founder of, of Genuity uh, is my boss. 
Um, and he has just been absolutely fantastic. He's a brilliant physician scientist that has basically given me the ball and said, just don't drop it. And if you do, <laughs> back and let me know about it. Uh, and so we started with a very small bioinformatics team back in 2015. I was working with the research computing group at the Harvard Medical School. And Jeff asked me if I would come across the river and start. Um, I don't think he knew that it was going to blossom into an AI lab. He, 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 he brought me over uh, to expand the bioinformatics team. And we just hit the ground running. And so we were in our heyday, we were at about 18 a full-blown computational statistics and bioinformatics group that then blossom into this, this advanced AI research uh, laboratory here at Genuity. So, you know, not to pick on, you know, our, you know, the pharma companies and, uh, but what's wrong with the way that they're doing it? And what are you trying to think? <laughs> Harry, you're going to get me in trouble with that no, question. No, no, come on. Because right? I mean, I, I've got some pretty strong opinions uh, of that right now. But it, 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 it comes down to, and it's just not pharma, but there are a number of biotechs. And in fact, if, you know, for all your listeners that have been following, you know, the, the, the advent uh, or the reinsurgence, if you will, of deep learning. And then that was around 2006 or so. But it really came on the scene uh, from the biotech standpoint about 2014, 2015. And listening to some of the hype that exists in this space, you would have thought that we had already cured cancer uh, by now. We haven't. We but haven't. Is, I thought we had. No. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're 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 getting closer, uh, but we're not we're not there yet. So there are still some shortcomings uh, with. And when, when we say artificial intelligence, we are not building machines you know, in this space that are capable of human cognition. These are machine learning algorithms that are actually able to detect patterns within all of this high dimensional omics, clinical, deep phenotypic data. We've now integrated real world evidence uh, into what we are doing. And yeah. how do you actually pick out, You know, these algorithms can can define the patterns, but can they do it in a reproducible manner? And we, to be quite honest with you, we still struggle with that. Because if we cut our data up, train these algorithms, and then test on the data that we've left out, we can get really, really good or consistent classification performance. But if we were to do that again, and again, and again, we end up getting, again, consistent classification performance, but the underlying features that are associated with each cut of that data and each run of these individual algorithms are a bit different each time because we have such a large degree of correlation bias feature dependency within these data sets that it's very difficult then to go downstream and define the actual underlying biology at that molecular level uh, to go further with. And I think that's what that's, and I think most would agree with me in this space is that's what pharma struggles with. It's what we still struggle with. So we have, we are working outside of the box, if you will. So we're looking at statistical optimization approaches and, and basically inventing the math and statistics on different computing architectures, such as quantum computing, right. uh, neuromorphic computing. We have been uh, researching or investigating uh, on these architectures uh, for a while now, um, and it it looks it looks promising. But I don't want to fuel that that the hype that currently exists in this space because there's even more hype with quantum computing than there is with artificial intelligence. Oh right yeah, now. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember listening to one of your talks at MIT about quantum computing. I want to say it was uh, two or three years ago, something yeah. like that, when you were there. So as you think about improving the process, you know, where do you see the biggest opportunities coming from? And, and, and so I'm, I, this is sort of a leading question because I have a sense that we're in an area where we have so much new data about gene networks at the cellular level. And we're only starting to translate that into specific insights about drug targets. And we need better ways to do that. And so I'm not trying to say that that's necessarily the opportunity, but where do you see the, the biggest opportunities that are coming? Well, we've got two areas that I think that we can improve on. 
that we can greatly improve on. One is the type of data that we're modeling. And the other one are the type of algorithms that we're actually developing. And so I can talk to you a little bit about both of those, those areas because merging single cell science with very advanced analytical tools, machine learning tools, yeah. I think is going to redefine, do nothing short of redefining our basically our, our current collective understanding of human biology. And we have evidence there. We had a couple big papers that came out last year. Uh, we collaborate very closely uh, with not only pharmaceutical partners, but academic partners uh, as well. And, and what we're doing with the machine learning right now is that we have just now scratched the surface with being able to ask why. Not what correlates with the disease, but actually what is driving the disease. So we are integrating probabilistic programming and causal inference into everything that we're doing to get to that point where that these, I had mentioned earlier, these causal dependency structures are actually reflective of the signal transgushing cascades. So two proteins interact with each other on the cell surface and set off a series of events that lead to a, a cellular response, a cellular molecular response, is that we are getting closer to being able to model that uh, in a much, much more robust manner. The second part of that is the data. So we've now moved into an era and I think we're pretty well entrenched in it. Uh, we've been working on this for about the last three years now and that's single cell science. So we know, relatively speaking, we know very little about biology. We even know significantly less about single cell biology and the last credible estimate that I came across or have come across is there are approximately 37.2 trillion cells in the average adult human body all working in concert with one another and we've been for the most part ignoring how these cells behave or work in concert uh, with each other and so by doing that we had a paper that came out uh, that we published in Nature Metabolism about mid-year uh, last year that we were working very closely uh, with Mike Simons. He's the founder of the Cardiovascular Research Institute at the Yale yep. Medical School. What we were able to do is generate, we use the AI to generate working hypotheses. And I think that this is important to talk about as well, is that we're not curing cancer with the AI. We're generating very, very sound robust, if you will, working hypotheses that then can be explored and validated uh, behind the bench experimentally. And what Mike Simon's team was able to do then, that information that we had given him, he was able to actually not only inhibit atherosclerosis, heart disease, if you will, and, and again, it's in a mouse model. So I've, I've received a fair amount of criticism with this. It's a model organism, but it's a first step to being able to do this in humans. So it's a gradual process. He was not only able to inhibit atherosclerotic plaque development in these animals, he was able to, once it did develop in his control animals, actually reverse it. And that is something that was just basically a real breakthrough. Uh, last year, and, and, and it was evidence of coupling the artificial intelligence very closely with these experimental approaches behind the bench. And, it, and it, what it did is it ended up saving a great deal of time and expense for Mike's group. And he was my first postdoc boss, and he'll tell you stories about how I spent four years phenotyping the Gypsy One or the Synecdon mouse, uh, where we actually published a paper earlier that year uh, and for all your listeners that know uh, of reverse genetics, where you cause a perturbation in DNA and then go hunt for the phenotype, we were able to do that within six months. What took me four years as my, you know, in my first, first postdoc, we were able to do in six months from an in silico standpoint, we were able to predict or the network that we developed, this gene network, was actually predictive of three vascular phenotypes that when he built the subsequent mouse model or, or actually induced the same genetic perturbation in these animals, because we started with human cells, those mice presented with those three vascular phenotypes. And that was a big paper that came out last year in the Journal of Experimental Medicine. Yeah, it just seems like every time I turn around, everything we're 
everything, first of all, we can do things we never could do before. And everything is happening a lot faster than I remember it taking before. Like I can't read fast enough sometimes to keep up with everything that's going on. Um, so there are tons of, you know, different types of AI and machine learning methods being used in drug discovery. And I know we can't talk about all of them in one interview, yeah. although that'd be interesting. Um, you know, if we concentrate in sort of the area that you're focused on, which sounds like, and from what I know is, uh, you know, causal inference, causal statistical learning, Bayesian networks and probabilistic programming, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, can you take a shot at, at explaining it so that, you know, a non-expert can understand? Yeah, well, I hope so. I'll take a crack at it because some, sometimes I struggle with it, what we're actually <laughs> doing. And that's that's one of the things that I, you know, try to impress upon uh, the team in the lab is that I don't want to run the risk. I think the real risk um, with artificial intelligence is that we're going to be exposed to so much knowledge and it's going to be much easier to acquire that knowledge that it doesn't end up in the long run dumb, dumbing us down in some some instances, if you will. So these are very, very sophisticated mathematical statistical techniques that are capable of defining what is important in a predictive analytic, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at the difference between two different cancer types, and you have 79,000 or 80,000 potential predictors in that model, can you build an algorithm that pulls out a pattern in all of that data that accurately, robustly, consistently is able to predict class one and class two in, in, a, in, a, in a binomial or binary uh, experimental design. Now we have done that in multi-class experimental designs or multinomial experimental designs. And with the Cancer Genome Atlas, why I came up with 79,000 molecular features is that's what we had, is that we have five different data types across 8,200 tumors representing 22 cancer types. And we were able to build an algorithm or a set of algorithms, which I think is, is more important. So we use ensemble computational intelligence. I've never trusted a single run of a single algorithm on a single right. cut of the data. So we use multiple algorithms on multiple cuts of the data to find what is most informative. And across those 8,200 tumors, we are at 99.7% accurate in being able to classify, to actually predict one of those 22 cancer types. And I refer to that. And so in that test set, that equates to misfiring or misclassifying only seven out of 8,200 tumors, right? Four of which are bladder cancers that are consistently misclassified as another tumor type. And so we believe that the algorithms when applied appropriately, when built appropriately, uh, are capable of defining or picking out the misannotation that can occur, the human misannotation, if you will, and in this case of these types of tumors. And so we've got a long ways to go to show that, but it's, it's evidence and what I refer to is if you, the analogy is facial recognition. Right. This right. is disease recognition. And where this is going is we've picked out a signature that is capable of differentiating one of 22 or 21 other cancer types. And what a physician can do with that information is they can sit down with a patient before they've even met them, the pre consult, and know exactly what type of tumor that that actually is. Now, in this Huge. case, it's only one of 22. But I foresee this going that we, we can do this with that molecular physiologic roadmap that we're working on that we had talked about earlier. Yep. Is that physicians, it's never going to replace the physician. And I, and I want to make sure that, that I am expressing that here with you this afternoon. It's, it's going to be a tool that allows the physician, the physician scientist, to actually do his or her job uh, much better. No, I mean, you know, if you can accurately diagnose someone, treating them 
at least starts to go down the uh, the right road faster. Right. Um, so I, I've heard you talk about opening up the black box and, you know, so that you're not just providing predictions about associations, but, but coming up with hypotheses about the underlying molecular connections, right? So without giving away sort of your secret sauce, um, you know, can you explain, you know, how you know how you might do that? What the unique and proprietary is here? With again, without yeah. giving away the sauce. Yeah. So so just to to take it out of that 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 black box. You know what everyone refers to as black box algorithms. We we just completely right. removed that. We are working with math that was first developed probably 270 years ago. So the Bayes theorem, conditional probability. You know this is what we're doing. Can we? actually look at you know, the probability of an event based on the knowledge of conditions that might be related to that event. And mm -hmm. so the problem comes in with this and why we're struggling with this, and I, I like to use the analogy, please forgive all my analogies, I, I'm trying to make it as entertaining <laughs> I do, as I, I, I do it all the time, don't worry. <laughs> okay. The, uh, we, we've had 130 years of collective engineering that's gone into the current state of the automobile. If your car doesn't start in the morning, you can rule out rotating the tires because it has nothing to do with the ignition system. And we know that because we have been, we've had a hand in that collective engineering. Now with human biology, we've had three and a half billion years of, of natural engineering that has gone into the current state of the cell. So actually modeling in in a large part observational data is extraordinarily tricky is that we can find what's associated with a disease but oftentimes that's problematic so if i go back to the analogy of the car i park in the left hand side of the garage right and before the pandemic hit if i was collecting observational data over a year there would be a perfect correlation to the position of that car in the garage or my car in the garage with the ignition system. I'd start that car and there would be that, that perfect correlation. Now, as, as ridiculous as that analogy sounds, that is a perfect correlation. And we quite often find these perfect correlations that actually end up being spurious correlations yep. because of all the, everything in the human genome is there for a reason. And to some degree or another, it all correlates. All these different entities within the genome correlate to a certain degree with everything else in the human genome. And so I think it's very important that we start building the math and the statistics to be able to address those questions. So can we predict the state of a gene based on the state of another gene? And that's how we start developing these networks or building these networks. And what we're finding is that when we go in experimentally and change the state of that gene, it actually changes the state of the network. And again, this is math that has been, you know, first developed 270 years ago by Thomas Bayes, right? right. So there's, there's not a whole lot of secret sauce on this right now. Now, the way that we apply it and the understanding, these, these are all very, I would say, uh, biologically uh, relevant algorithms. So we have at Genuity, we apply a great deal of biology domain knowledge into what we are doing to basically give the seed these algorithms, if you will, to give them a head start to actually be able to predict the differences between different states. So what do you think, I mean, we've been talking about this, I'm watching you know, tons of companies and tons of universities sort of going in this direction. I still think we haven't graduated enough people to do it as widespread as we like, but what are the biggest, like, is it scientific, technological, social to adopting these methods to drive, you know, drug discovery in the right directions. I'm, I'm, right. I'm, le I'm leading in a certain way because I believe that <laughs> this is the future, also. But, right. um, you know, I, I, I just I, I hear a lot of people talk about it. I know that it's not happening the way that I, I think it 
should or could happen. And maybe I'm just impatient. Right. So I'm going to step out on a limb here, Harry, a little bit. Now, I'm, I'm not a clinical psychologist by any means, but I, I think that this has to do uh, in large part with the unknown, you know, the human ego, fear of change, right? So yeah. if, if, if man were meant to fly, though, that you're getting back to that old adage is that yeah. now we're facing something here and there's a fair amount of the unknown. And there is so much misinformation or uninformed information that exists out there that is standing in the way. We're running into ethical issues. I don't think we're going to run into that biggest ethical issue with, with in this space, uh, in the biomedical sciences, is what happens when we finally are able to build these algorithms can, that can tell us exactly what's going on with the underlying dysregulated biology that then very, very accurately informs us on basically how to right the ship. Now we've got some ethical issues about, okay, we know how to right the ship, but can we do that, right? And so we're gonna have to be working, we're, we're gonna, the need to work with politicians uh, and others uh, in other fields to dispel a lot of the hype that exists out there. And it sells books, Harry, the AI stuff, it sells books. Singularity, I usually get answered that question, when is singularity gonna happen? And I don't wanna disappoint, but I strongly believe that it's not going to happen. That point in time where AI leads to the demise of, of humanity, I don't no. believe, I think it's going to be a very gradual synergistic marriage between human and artificial intelligence that actually shapes the trajectory of human evolution. That's where I believe that this is going, but it's going to be a very gradual process. Well, and I, but I do believe that people need to have, first of all, you have to, you know, maybe it'll take a generation or so, but, but you have to be comfortable with that, the two coming together. Right. Um, and you have to be curious because the system is going to throw something out and you're going to be like, what the, what? <laughs> I never thought about that. Right. And then at some point it's going to get better than you are in doing certain tasks. Well, just okay. It is. Yeah. And Harry, that's a very good point because I believe that it is better than us at certain things right now. And that is the ability to generate working hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So when I, 20 years ago, this was actual heresy. Wait, I, you know, I cut my teeth on the old DNA microarray days, right? Yep. Where we started being able to capture with a single assay, capture the entire, <clears throat> excuse me, transcriptome in a single assay. What that ends up doing is it's not hypothesis testing, it's hypothesis generating. Right. But then what the old schoolers at the time, and this is strange for me to say that at 57 now, but when I was a youngster cutting my teeth on this is that the old schoolers didn't see that the, it allows us to ask questions that we probably would not have been able to ask before the age of all of this high throughput, high dimensional omics type approaches that we're using with the AI is that it is hypothesis testing, but it's generating the hypothesis and allowing us to ask the right questions. Right. Well, I, I believe that is, is, and I say this to people and they look at me strange, but it's, I think we're seeing a modification of the scientific method. I'm not generating the hypothesis to start. It's giving me my top choices. Right. And then I'm sort of going down those roads because there is such a variety of data that's coming in that I, it's impossible if you, if you took 10 right. people in a room to try and you know, synthesize that data and the interactivity of that data to be able to say, you know, this is sort of, here's some areas you should look into. Um, I, I love this stuff. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I don't know, I need to give credit to somebody out there and it may have been a 60s song. Um, it, it, the actual answers lie within the questions. And can the AI get us to the point where we are asking the right questions? Right. And I believe that that's what AI <clears throat> in this space is going to be able to do uh, for us. And it's already doing that. We would have never gotten to those those publications last year and earlier this year, the cell stem cell paper, where we're actually looking at classifying 
various human disease states and cardiovascular disease uh, by cellular differentiation trajectory. So now we've applied it to longitudinal experimental designs and we can see we're not being able, we're not to the point where we can track a single cell over time, but we can take collections of cells and that right. signal is so strong that we can link those collections or clusters of cells in a longitudinal experimental design that actually forms a disease trajectory, if you will, in classification of human disease. And again, it gets back to this underlying molecular physiologic blueprint of human biology. So I'm gonna I'm gonna now ask you to be the futurist, right? Mm -hmm. um, zoom out and paint a picture for people listening. Near term, and then long term futures look like. You know, how much do you think AI machine learning can help speed up drug discovery in the next five years? And then I, I mean I don't want to go out as far as fifty years, but you know, say five years in the next maybe twenty years, because it's moving so right. fast. It is moving quickly, but I think that we need to to get a get, to get a handle on this. And those that are working in the space, I think it's very very important that we help educate the lay the lay population of exactly the capabilities of what we are doing. So where I see this in the near term is using some of these existing uh, computing architectures that we have, these high performance computing architectures with the known established statistical optimization approaches that we have. We marry that with single cell science and we start garnering a much greater in-depth understanding of human biology. And this is greatly going to advance our ability to identify the right target, drug target, to then to build more efficacious targets on top of. As you probably well know, 75% of all uh, pharma, you know, R&D that's associated with pharma can be directly attributed to clinical trials. And I hope that this does not sound arrogant on my behalf, but I believe is that we're going after the wrong targets. We're still within that, that we still haven't moved in the causal inference fully. We haven't jumped into it feet first. We're, we're, we're taking our time, making sure that it's right, but we're still going after things that associate. We're addressing the symptoms, not the causes. So in the near term, within the next five years, I see that happening, is that we're going to end up, you know, it's going to afford the means to develop much, much more efficacious drugs. We're going to be able to repurpose existing drugs. So there may be a drug associated, I always use the analogy of, uh, of asthma. We might mm -hmm. be able to apply that in a cancer state where inflammation is driving uh, tumor genesis. You know, it's right. those types of things that we're going to see that are going to start surfacing. Now, looking out further with this, I think we are going to get, and this is what we are coming, what we're realizing is we're very limited right now with statistical optimization. And so in, in, the, in the long term, 10, 20 years down the road, we're gonna, we're gonna actually, and if it's, if it's not me, Harry, there's somebody here that we're working closely with that's gonna end up doing this and you know, actually get a handle on statistical optimization approaches in integrating other computing architectures such as quantum uh, computing, which will right. afford quantum machine learning. In fact, we have a paper under review that is the first successful demonstration of classification of human cancer patients from a multi-omic standpoint with a quantum machine learning algorithm. And we're having, oh. a, we're, we're having a, a really tough time getting this thing published, right? Because there's so many things here that, that we've stepped out into the unknown, right? Uh, I think that uh, just here, probably before the end of the year, we're going to know whether we're going to get it published or not. But we're working on a COVID-19 project with the University of Strasbourg that we have integrated quantum support vector machines on a very small cohort. And we believe, or I'm saying, I guess what I should do is, is tamp this down a little bit. I get kind of excited. When <laughs> is that we have a promising signature for why patients 
actually move from being admitted to the hospital on oxygen right. to then being admitted into these ICU, ICU units yeah. and yeah. needing uh, mechanical ventilation to address the acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. And so we have used in combination with established approaches, we have used quantum machine learning to help define that informative signature. So I think we're gonna see more and more and more of that. And then looking out a little bit further down the road, what's every bit as you know, promising as quantum machine learning is neuromorphic computing, because yep. this affords longitudinal experimental designs. And so what I had talked to you a little bit about or shared with you and your, your listeners earlier about that cell stem cell paper and the longitudinal right. experimental designs, is to be able to do that in a much, much more robust way uh, with, with neuromorphic uh, processors and spiking neural networks. So I usually get answered that question, you know, where is deep learning? Is deep learning going to be the future of AI? The, you know, the easy question is yes, or the direct question is yes, but I think it's going to be a form. It's going to be a spiking neural network uh, or topology that's associated with that, that we can actually integrate longitudinal experimental designs and move away from the, the cross-sectional study designs that uh, are useful, but then, you know, can be problematic uh, as well. So we're going to need a whole new breed of people to help take this forward. Cause I, I, I've, I talk to people all the time and there's, there's not enough people that are, let's say trained in this, in these two areas that you need, right, to, to drive this forward. Um, we're just not graduating enough people. I mean, Google keeps stealing them. We need to, right. to bring right. them over to our side. Right, and, and I think that that's going to fall largely uh, on academia, the major university programs, developing that domain expertise. And when I say domain expertise, you know, this is gonna touch every, every sector of modern society. But when oh, yeah. we're looking at healthcare here, is can you take you know somebody that has been formally trained in molecular biology, but also give them the quantitative skills to actually move forward? So for the days of the the molecular biologist that was trained in in the era of one gene hunting and pecking, as I refer to it, is that you you take a gene out, you scramble it, you put it back into a system, mm -hmm. you evaluate it. That has all been very useful that basically the, the knowledge domain that we have currently is in a large part based on, on that approach. But can you take that molecular biologist, couple it, you know, or, or give them the quantitative skills to start building these algorithms to start, and again, at the end of the day, so that we can ask the right questions. On the flip side of the coin, and in bioinformatics, you usually have those that come from the biology domain right. or the computer science domain. So those that are coming from computer science are going to have to acquire that, that, that deep uh, biology domain expertise to be able to marry all of this. Yeah, so, I yes, remember at, at ABI, we used to have to take two guys, put them in a room, right? Or, yeah, and, and <laughs> man, it took them a long time to figure out how to talk to each other. No. Um, but, you know, getting to some, you know, harder numbers, I mean, my, my belief is that you could, that I'm, I'm, you know, you could cut out three years or four years on the front end of the discovery process with the technologies we're talking about. Are you talking drug, drug discovery? Yes. Because that's kind of all over the map right now. And I, and I think most would agree that it's 10 years and over $2 billion to actually bring a drug to market. Now, I've been talking with folks out there that are coming up with all sorts of in, ingenuous, in, not ingenuous, approaches, if you will, <laughs> to be able to do this. So um, David Barry at Volo Health, you know, yep. he's working on things that, you know, can we do that? You know, can, can we significantly cut the amount of expense and time down to two years to bring a drug to market? That's left to be seen. We, we need to wait to see if that can, if, if that will happen. But I think that that's the direction that we're actually going. And what I'm working on or what we're working on in, in the team is to make sure that what we are finally or eventually bringing to bear 
is actually going to be more efficacious, right? It's yes. going to be effective because we are hitting those mechanisms of action, those, those, the dysregulated biology that's leading to disease. And from where I sit, that's the most important. Not how long it takes to bring a, a drug to bear, but can you bring an effective drug to market uh, in a much more efficient manner? And I think that's what AI is going to do for us. But if we're both right, I see a, a shift in the business model. I see a deflationary effect that's coming from the technology itself, because you're always getting more for the same amount or less. Right. Would, would you agree, though, that that pendulum has has shifted in this direction, if you will, to all of that AI hype right now, is that it, it needs to shift more towards where we were, where we were coming from. It's, it's, it's all AI is, is that we, we've got a magic wand and that is not anywhere close to reality uh, right now, Harry. No, and, but I think it depends on where you're applying that in this giant you know, process that we've got, right? Yep. And I am seeing leaps in different areas at different points, like almost when I least expect it, something happens. So I'm, I'm constantly encouraged that like, you know, people say, well, it's gonna slow down or it's gonna stop or we're gonna go into another winter. I'm like, ah, I'm not so sure about that, right? Because I see the tech industry driving things forward um, right. and, we borrow all that stuff or we use all that stuff and they're not slowing down. And so I see it helping us now. Biology doesn't always, you know, function or do what you want it to do. And there's a lot of discovery to go on there, but right. I'm bull I'm bullish that in parts of medicine, we're going to see it have a dramatic difference when it comes to imaging capabilities, when it comes to pathology. Um, and that's going to feed, the real-time data that you're trying to use. Right. Um, so I, I just see things happen, happening on a multifactorial level. I'm not trying to hype it. I'm just saying, I don't think it's slowing down. I think it's, it's, it's found a cadence that it's going forward on. And even when we think it's slowing down or coming to a stop, somebody's trying to find a different way to come at it. Right. So Harry, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think the cadence needs to slow a bit. There is so much AI hype right now. I think that that's going to start falling away, right? Yeah. We are still waiting for that first AI driven therapeutic to come to market. And yes. I've heard that there's some companies and I'm, I'm not mentioning them that right. have actually done that or achieved that or working on that. I think that that's where that's going. Yep. But a lot of what has come up within the, you know, the last five years or so, to a great, to a great de degree, if I may say this, you know, to your listen listeners, is just absolute nonsense. Is yeah. that it's it's going to take a lot of hard work, and the AI yep. I think can expedite the process as long as is it applied in the right manner. And there's an old adage out there, and I I. You know, statistics don't lie, right? Yep. But they can be naively applied and mm -hmm. horribly misinterpreted. And so we're in this era, this era right now with artificial intelligence that, okay, is this real? Is it not? And we right. haven't taken a time. From my own personal opinion here, we haven't taken enough time to experimentally validate, especially in this space right now. Now, I'm not talking image analysis. Because right. we we're, we're we've now moved into digital pathology and and imaging, uh, building these algorithms off of various biomedical imaging modalities, and they're highly accurate, but they're much much less involved than what we're doing at the molecular level. Correct. So these are nearly more complex or complicated when we're addressing human biology. So you know the Googles out there that have advanced that, fantastic. That has real application in digital pathology that can help with clinical trials, inclusion, exclusion criteria, and do it much, much in a much more cost-effective manner. I absolutely agree. But I think that cadence of where, I think it's gonna slow and I think it needs to slow 
is that we really need to understand and have a, a, a strong understanding of what it is currently, the state of the art. What, what is the current state of the art? And that has not been defined. And so again, I'm not disagreeing with you. No, 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 yeah, I agree. Just, but I, you know, after, I feel like I've gone through a couple of cycles now um, in different areas. And what I always see is the hype happens. A lot of money goes into the space. Right. Nobody knew what they were doing when they started. Some of those things go bust. A lot of them may go bust. You graduated a new, it's, it's almost like a new university because nobody knew what they were doing. And now the second time around, they're like, ah, we tried it that way. It didn't work. Let's try this way. And you get a new crop of people because we're not teaching any of this really in school. Right. You're not learning it until you get into a company and actually cut your teeth on the real work. Yep. Yep. So I think sometimes we need the hype cycle. Otherwise we won't build enough of a uh, foundation of people to, to take it to the next one. Yeah, and in, in that that Gardner hype cycle curve, you know, I, I, most would 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 place deep learning kind of at the pinnacle of those inflated expectations. I don't think that we're going, and especially what we're doing and others are doing by taking the time to experimentally validate what we're we're doing, is that we're we're not going to run into that trough of disillusionment. Is that we're going to going to move straight across, but Correct. it's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of effort, and there is no magic wand. Uh, with any of this no i mean as an investor i'm glad there's no magic one because you know you're then you're always worried about losing right so you're you're you got to find multiple bets that yep. you believe in the team that can then get it to the other side tom you know it, as always it's a it's a great pleasure and you know uh great to talk to you and great to have you on the show and and i i can only wish you incredible luck in, in everything you're doing because people like me will benefit yeah, well, fantastic, Harry. And again, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I hope I haven't bored all of your listeners to tears here, but it's always a real pleasure uh, <laughs> talking to you. And, and, you know, thanks for the forum here, because I do think it's an incredible time to be working in this space. Yes, excellent. All right, well, stay safe. You too. Thank you, Harry.